I'm delighted to be here to be able to uh, talk to you all uh, and hopefully hear from you as well. I'm going to be here for the whole day, I hope, unless I'm pulled back to the office for something. Uh, so do come and chat to me uh, if you'd like to know more. Um, as Dirk hinted, uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a, a one instance of management ideas spreading um, back in, well, 10 years ago, I think, more than 10 years ago. Uh, I came across Dirk and his research almost by the most traditional way possible, which is a press release from the University of Liverpool, where, uh, where Dirk was then at the management school, uh, promoting the work of him and a colleague with the headline, Research Questions Role of Neuroscience in Leadership Studies. You'll remember that around that time, we were talking about this last night, the great fad was neuroscience and leadership, and uh, Dirk was taking issue with that. And two weeks later, that research featured in my FT column uh, with, I think, a slightly catchier headline, Leadership That Will Mess With Your Head. Um, so what I want to do today is just briefly lay out five ways that management research finds its way to me as a journalist, or I find my way to it. And then I hope there'll be time, uh, Dirk, you'll stop me when we get to the end here, but the uh, uh, time for questions and a bit of discussion, uh, which I look forward to. Um, briefly about me, Dirk has laid out uh, a bit my career. I think, uh, well, as of next month, I will have been 36 years at the FT. Um, I started as a graduate trainee and I progressed via London to Brussels, Milan, <coughs> Uh, New York and then back to London. And critically for this discussion, I've seen both sides of being a journalist. I've been a reporter and correspondent, uh, and I've also been an editor. Um, and about 15 years of my long career has been as a columnist, including 11 writing our weekly management column. So that amounts to about, in that particular role, 500 columns, of which I estimate between a third and a half quoted or referred to or were based on business school research. Since April last year, I've been our senior business writer with a bit of a wider brief to write about big business stories in more depth and at greater length. And I mention that because, unfortunately for you, there aren't quite as many outlets for me to write about your work, uh, just in case that becomes a kind of um, pitch that you're making later. A quick look at how journalism works. Briefly, there are two ways of directing news to the FT and other media. One is to an editor, uh, and an editor is more powerful because they can tell reporters uh, and writers what to write, but they're generally not as knowledgeable as the writer or the specialist writer would be, and they often lack time to consider very detailed pitches. Or to directly to a writer, because if it excites the writer's interest, uh, then he or she pitches to the editor, uh, or in the case of a columnist, might float the idea uh, for weekly coverage in their column. So this is a discussion really about how writers work, particularly how this writer works. I want to just say at the outset, I once got into trouble for criticizing or seeming to criticize management theorists by sort of dismissing them as ivory tower academics. Um, and I do recognize the value of management theory, but I am a great fan of management research that has an impact on and in real life management and on real life managers. And in fact, I made a sort of resolution when I started my management column in, in 2011 uh, that I would initially only call business schools if I wanted to illustrate a story or idea, rather than basing my column on the research. And I, I did relax that later in my tenure, but it turned out to be more or less true that whatever the topic, there's almost always a business school researcher out there who has written about it and is available, indeed enthusiastic, to talk about their field. To some degree, the same rules apply to research as apply to news in general. As journalists, we're always asking, is this new? Is this surprising or different? Is it interesting, not just to me, but to our readers? And am I the only person or the first person who gets to write about this? Can it be an exclusive? So the five ways in which management ideas spread 
two journalists, and Elizabeth may add to these later uh, from her experience. And I should say here that I'm going to mention a few columns and pitches, and I'll be happy to share via email later um, the links to the columns themselves and also some screenshots of the pitches themselves if you're interested. So the first way is the journalist asks. So I come up with an idea. I will go to a, an academic and say, would you talk to me about it? In 2018, I, I wrote a column with the headline, is it time to kiss goodbye to cheek to cheek greetings, uh, which was about how, um, this was pre-pandemic obviously, uh, how the handshake and to some degree the social kiss are power plays. You remember it was a weird time when Donald Trump was shaking hands in weird ways with people like Emmanuel Macron to show his dominance. Uh, and I got in touch with uh, Julia Suvileto, who was then at Oxford University and had studied social touching and simply reached out to her and said, you know, this is something I'm writing about. Would you talk? She did. And we uh, I included some of her work in the column. How do I generally go about finding whom to contact? Well, a lot of obvious ways. And I'd be happy to hear if you think there are others that I'm missing here. Obviously, via the Internet, Google Scholar, other, other sources. Factiva is the archive system that we use, and often by searching you know, research professor and the t topic, you can discover where people have written before or been um, interviewed before. Uh, business school websites, uh, increasingly email search. Uh, as I developed in that role, obviously I had a number of emails that came in with unsolicited requests to uh, for me to interview people and nothing ever gets wasted. I always save it. Uh, I've got the reverse of inbox zero, whatever that is. But the res result of that is that I can search my inbox quite easily to find topics and pitches that have been made to me. Social media, Twitter or what's now X, I run or ran a, a curated list on X, which actually you can also join, uh, of management which covered a lot of people who I felt were active and some schools that were active on social media so that when I was really lost for an idea, I might have a quick scroll through that to see who was talking about what. My own contacts, obviously, important for journalists to, to run a series of contacts and be able to talk to people from time to time about what's new. Uh, and something that obviously wasn't around when I was doing that role, but that I'm now very interested in exploring clearly Generative AI might turn out in due course to be a place where I would go to say, what sources should I use? And in fact, I did ask ChatGPT to find some sources on today's topic, and it referred me to my own talk. <laughs> uh, it said, you might find his insights useful for your work. So, And then another uh, source, obviously, business school roundups. A lot of business schools do uh, just pick out some examples in Seattle Knowledge. Kellogg School does a good newsletter. And of course, the, if you like the management reviews, MOT Sloan, HBR, and uh, the obvious examples of those. I, I would always look at something that came in from a business school. Often they're doing their own bits of collected research just to highlight, turn down the corner of a page if I got it in print to say, okay, that might be interesting, something to, something to look at. So that's the journalist asks. The second obvious route is the business school pitches as, as uh, University of Liverpool Management School did with, with Dirk's work. Last year, I, I wrote a, an article titled The Paradox That Leads Professionals Into Temptation, which was based on um, work by Sunita Saar from Cornell and a visiting professor at Judge, and an article from Ad Academy of Management Perspectives, which was about the, how a manager's sense of professionalism, the greater a manager's sense of professionalism, the more likely he or she is to accept a gift or bribe. Instant kind of antennae twitching for that one because professional services, professionals in general, are huge readers of the FT and that topic is always extremely popular. And that came from a very cleverly worded um, pitch from Judge Business School which pointed out a number of things that were critical to me. One is that it had only just been published and we can talk later about novelty in management research and whether that is a correct way for me and other journalists to think about using research. It summarized the findings, so I didn't have to go right through the full study, but 
it also attached the full study. I can't tell you the amount of time I spend going back to business schools and saying, thank you for your summary. Please now can I see the full research because I want to read what the original looked like and draw my own conclusions. And it also made clear, and this may seem like this is more of a communications point, that this research had been sent to more than one FT journalist because there's nothing more frustrating than finding an interesting story, doing a bit of work, researching it, and then discovering that your colleague two desks over is also working on the same thing because they received it. So that's the business school direct approach. Uh, and actually you'd be surprised, uh, I was surprised certainly, how few business schools actually do pitch directly. I, I felt there's a lot of management schools, business schools out there, and I only see a fraction of what they're putting out. The third approach is you know, established research revisited, let's say. So classic example in, in 2021, I went back to a bit of research that I'm quite fond of, Sheena Yenga and Mark Lepper's famous uh, choice uh, survey, the JAM survey, the one about which shows that too much choice actually prevents people or deters people from, from buying. And that's a bit of research, like a lot of very popular and headline grabbing research that has been, uh, has suffered the, the replication problem. Difficult to replicate. Uh, lots of people have tried. Lots of people have criticised. Sheena Yengar, who I know, obviously defends it still. She's written a book about it. Anyway, it came up in the context of the pandemic, narrowing choice on shelves. And my point was, this is research that demonstrates that actually it's quite a good thing to probably try and narrow your choices, even if you're forced, only doing it because you're forced to do it an opportunity to scale back range and encourage, encourage purchase. Just to indicate how the FT is a broad church, Tim Harford, who you will all know to be another weekly columnist on the FT, who also touches on research often, he contacted me afterwards and said, I disagree. I really think that research doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to me that it's anything like um, uh, plausible that this would happen. Uh, and in any case, most uh, supermarkets are still you know, deluging us with choice. And indeed, he wrote then a few months later another column taking that view. So just an indication that there's more than one view possible within the FT. And also, I think, a reminder for me, although my article did, did reference clearly the debate that's sprung up in the last 25 years over that uh, initial study, that as authors, um, journalists have to be a bit careful when they're looking at social sciences and any research that there is a uh, that there hasn't been a re-examination or indeed a total withdrawal of one uh, of research. That has only happened to me once when I made a kind of glancing reference to a bit of research and a reader almost immediately pointed out that actually on the abstract it said that they had withdrawn essentially the substance of the whole research and I had to correct it. Fourth version is the academic pitching directly. Clearly this works best where there's an established relationship. Dirk has been very good at pitching and quite successful at pitching his work, his later work to me after we established that first relationship. And that actually, um, obviously you are more likely as a journalist or anybody to open an email from somebody who you know. Uh, and it, particularly if the first round of interaction has been fruitful. And this might not be, it's worth saying, as I mentioned, articles that I've written are not always just research-based, in fact, that's probably the minority of them. But I'm writing across a wide, even now still writing across a wide range of issues, and I'm often looking for things, experts to quote, research to reference in larger pieces. So in 2016, I wrote about how to topple bureaucracy, and that was uh, a piece that drew on research that Gary Hamill and Michele um, Zanini had drawn my attention to, their famous research now about bureaucracy and the weight of uh, cost of bureaucracy for uh, developed economies. So, uh, you know, an opportunity again to pitch something which I was then able to pick up on. They again held out a little bit of bait to say I could use that exclusively if I wanted to, and I was able to build, a, uh, build it into a longer piece about bureaucracy. One, incidentally, that didn't take as read their conclusions, but examine both sides of the debate, bureaucracy good, bureaucracy bad. And then the fifth way is the kind of conference roundup. So I get invited to quite a lot of events. I'm always on the lookout for ideas. I am somebody who wants to discuss those ideas. 
uh, and they may not immediately generate something, but there's almost always a, uh, an opportunity to use ideas. And sometimes I'll use the whole conference. So in 2020, when the Academy of Management annual meeting was online, I still haven't actually been to an in-person Academy of Management meeting, although they used to have a very good uh, and uh, diligent comms person who promised me a martini if I ever turned up at the... Uh, at the actual event, but online uh, in 2020, I was eager to find evidence of business school research that was immediately addressing what was happening to us then in the pandemic and the consequences of working from home and all the implications. And lo and behold, there was a whole session of sort of um, flash presentations about what various business school academics were doing in that area. And I was able to write a piece that was essentially in praise of management research that does have an impact on the real world. And I wrote in that piece, which I think is, is relevant for our discussion here today, management academics are more vulnerable than other scholars to the accusation that they live in ivory towers. I think that's true because if you've got management in your title or leadership in your title, you ought to be engaging with real managers and real leaders. And I said the contrast with managers tackling real world problems on the business front line is sometimes stark. Chief executives could take office, fail, and start enjoying early retirement in the time it takes a theoretical study to complete its journey from hypothesis to peer-reviewed publication. Bit of an exaggeration, but possibly still the case. One point that we, we might enlarge on in discussion is the extent to which we as journalists should be more wary of headline-grabbing claims. I think when I was writing my weekly column was, if you like, at the sort of peak interest in uh, particularly behavioural science uh, research, and the scrutiny applied to that particular branch uh, of the research in the wake of, uh, of what I circumspectly would call the, the Francesca Gino allegations, has made me realise the extent to which even if you're a curious, um, intelligent and experienced journalist, you're under-equipped to analyse really the implications and certainly to test the solidity of complex years-long multi-author studies. So I think I would be more cautious now about taking as read the pitch that I might get, whether it came direct from the academic or the, or the business school. And I think that whole affair is an indication of how the quest for impact and the pressure to publish have consequences, not always good ones. But I do still believe what I wrote in 2021 um, about management research, taking the famous speech by uh, Meryl Streep's fashion editor character in The Devil Wears Prada, you remember that um, she takes to task her assistant, Anne Hath, played by Anne Hathaway, for wearing a lumpy blue sweater. But, she says, that lumpy blue sweater is the product of the designer collections that hit the catwalk with a particular cerulean blue uh, that had its ripple effect right down to the racks from which Anne Hathaway was buying her lumpy sweaters. And I do think that radical management ideas and interesting research, even theoretical research, should and does percolate down to the front line of business, perhaps not in the way that the, that the research intended, sometimes distorted, sometimes it's a bad thing for research to go viral, and we can discuss that. But I do think that happens and should happen. Let me just end on uh, my remarks, and then I hope we can talk about some of this, on an update note by saying that I started this week celebrating a role model for me in the popularization and distribution of impact-making management research, Amy Edmondson. The Bayes Dean Andre uh, Spicer was among those present with me on Monday to see her book, Right Kind of Wrong, win the Financial Times and Schroeder's Business Book of the Year Award. The first, I've been helping the award since it started in 2005, but this is the first mainstream management book to win the 19 year, in the 19-year history of the prize. And I interviewed Amy on Tuesday, uh, and she reiterated the importance of what she called bilingualism in management studies. She said, management research needs to be something that is usable by managers. And she said her modus operandi has always been to try to do rigorous research that passes muster with peer review and that has more obvious implications for managers, and then to try to write about it in an accessible way. And that seems like a good motto for today and the discussion today. It's, of course, as we're going to discuss, much 
easier said than done. Thank you very much.